This is what happens when you combine advanced researchers from Google DeepMind with an equally advanced physics engine, Mujico. Mujico? Mujico. We're going to look at three papers today that explain everything you're seeing right now. Paper 1. Emergence of Locomotion Behaviors in Rich Environments I want to see robots beat humans in a soccer match. But right now, it looks like they need a little training. Whoa! Now that's what I'm talking about. Look at these guys go. No, uh, hold on a second. Before we get too excited, damn. I bet the authors had to hand engineer multiple reward functions for each of these behaviors for jumping, dodging, or turning. That's like a lot of work. Well, I guess if we want to understand this, we should dive into all these different reward functions and, uh, what? That's all there is? Go right? That's all they tell the agent as it's learning? Going right is good? And it can jump and dodge and basically be a parkour master? How can this agent learn all these cool moves with just one reward function? Well, from the paper, it appears the secret is the environment. Uh, a bit blockier. Okay, closer, closer, just lose the textures. Okay, yeah, that's, that's the environment they used. Using procedurally generated environments that get more difficult in time, like the hurdles get higher and the gaps get wider, the agent learns all these moves themselves. This type of increasing difficulty is known as curriculum learning. You have to know your ABCs before you can read. The random or procedural nature of the environment also gives the agent a lot of variety. That means its policy isn't going to overfit to a specific behavior, which would then fail poorly on an unseen environment. The takeaway for paper one, and a great quote from the authors in the discussion section, is this. Choosing a seemingly more complex environment may actually make learning easier. Paper 2, Learning Human Behaviors from Motion Capture by Adversarial Imitation. Okay, those agents had some pretty sweet moves, but how do we get them to act a bit more human? We've been trying to imitate our form and function for centuries. This robot was possibly created by Leonardo da Vinci all the way back in 1495. It could sit and stand, move its arms, and even had an anatomically correct jaw. Its behavior was programmable, so you could change the order that it did things, but the behavior was also rigid. It basically repeated the same motions as you turn the crank. We have much more complex robots now, mostly simulations of robots, and it was the task of the authors of paper two to impart those robots with more human-like motions. Reinforcement learning allowed them to get the agents moving but sometimes they move like this. So how did the authors get more human-like motion? Well, they captured the motion of humans. Motion capture. So using this motion capture data, how did they generate new behaviors? Uh, generate Machine learning, neural networks, uh, generative, generative, uh, generative adversarial networks, of course. A discriminator network tries to classify movements as coming from mocap 
or from a different network imitating the mocap data. The only way the imitation network can fool the discriminator is by making more and more human-like behaviors. Why did they choose generative networks for this? Well, before, they would have had to come up with some sort of similarity metric between the generated motions and the human mocap data. But with generative adversarial networks, that becomes the discriminator's job. Yay, automation. You can do it. The takeaway for paper two, imitate human behavior using motion capture data, and then repurpose with generative training. Paper three, robust imitation of diverse behaviors. Okay, this is our final bite. Let's get a bit more robust. Here's an agent trained with just a generative model. He's moving all right, but he suffers from something called mode collapse. So that means he's lacking in a diversity of behaviors. So how do the authors of paper three fix this fault of generative networks? Well, they did a bit of comparison. And if you look at the trade-offs for supervised methods and generative methods, you can see that the strengths and weaknesses alternate. Generative techniques produce robust policies but have undiverse behaviors. Supervised methods like variational autoencoders are not as robust as generative models. They can fail when the agent state diverges from the training data too much, but they learn diverse behaviors. I mean, combining the two is just obvious, right? Ah, uh, not really. Good work, guys. I would never have thought of that. Here are some results from the plentiful supplemental video provided by the generous authors of Paper 3. This simulation of a robotic arm, which is actually simulating a real-life robotic arm developed by Kinova Robotics, shows a great ability to imitate training data and test data and can also be transitioned from one behavior to another with the output in the arm being semantically meaningful. And here's a humanoid simulation with many more degrees of freedom, so much more things can go wrong, but you can see that the imitations are really spot on. We also see this great transitioning ability again between different behaviors, different walks. And using the supervised part of their technique, they can generate new behaviors from single observations. The takeaway for paper three. Use the advantages of both generative and supervised methods to obtain robust policies capturing diverse behaviors. Robust policies and diverse behaviors.